Zombie Science, Part 1. This morning we're going to be beginning a uh, review of the book by Jonathan Wells just out this last year. Uh, Zombie Science, More Icons of Evolution. Um, it follows another one which um, it's called Icons of Evolution, Science, or Myth. Also by Jonathan Wells. And uh, it's worth reading the first one if you haven't read it as well. Um, the book is kind of eye-catching. Um, if you look carefully, you will notice that there are actually two icons of evolution that are being mocked in the, uh, uh, on the front. Um, uh, we first come to the acknowledgments, which uh, have the usual acknowledgments, which I won't read to you about all the people that helped the book and so forth, but the uh, second paragraph is kind of interesting. For making embarrassingly candid or unwittingly humorous statements, I would like to thank, in alphabetical order, David Barash, Jerry Coyne, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, W. Ford Doolittle, who will figure in chapter two, uh, Niles Eldridge, Douglas Fujuma, Carl Giberson, Jeffrey Miller, Kenneth Miller, Randy Olson, Kevin Padian, Massimo Piglucci, Donald Prothero, Eugenie Scott, and Michael Shermer. I noticed that um, Stephen Jay Gould's name is not in there. Maybe that's because he's uh, deceased now. But um, um, he says, I also gratefully acknowledge help from several students who must remain anonymous lest enforcers of the scientific consensus destroy their very promising careers. <laughs> Just a little side note, and that's of course Jonathan Wells uh, signing out. And um, he starts uh, with the first chapter. He does, there's no preface or uh, introduction or anything. Just boom. Who let the zombies out? Zombies are the walking dead. In science, a theory or image is dead when it doesn't fit the evidence. I wrote a book in 2000 about 10 images, 10 icons of evolution that did not fit the evidence and were empirically dead. They should have been buried, but they are still with us, haunting our science classrooms and stalking our children. They are part of what I call zombie science. Egg on their face. I like eggs for breakfast. Uh, this is, uh, I put everything in, or uh, what the significant stuff. In fact, I've been eating eggs for years. I knew I was not supposed to, according to the American Heart Association and the United States Department of Agriculture. Science had proven that eggs, especially egg yolks, contained too much cholesterol and were thus bad for my heart. Uh, he talks about the studies with cherry picking, and he talks about the food pyramid, which some of you may remember, said I ate eggs anyway. Imagine my relief when in February 2015, the US government called off its decades long war on eggs by announcing cholesterol is not considered a nutrient of concern for overconsumption. Eggs were never bad for us. Indeed, whole eggs are close to being a perfect food. But science said, yes, and now science says something else. What should we make of this? Obviously, we cannot always trust what science says, and an endorsement by the government doesn't make it any more trustworthy. You have to understand, this is a guy who, um, although he regrets the cause he did it for, um, went to jail for being a, a Vietnam draft refuser. And then he has a little thing, it's in a gray box in the book, but I put it in red because I think it's appropriate. Warning, this book is politically correct, incorrect, that should read, even dangerous. If you are seen reading it on a college campus, your career could suffer. 
so you may want to disguise it with a different cover. The supplement on page 189 shows how to make a plain paper cover. <laughs> <laughs> Remember this from a, uh, uh, this is from a draft dodger, our previous draft dodger. How can you know whether something science says is true? Ultimately, you will have to discern the truth for yourself. This doesn't mean there is no objective truth and everything is subjective. Notice he is not postmodern. But sometimes people, even decent intelligent people, commit themselves to an idea that seems reasonable yet distorts the objective truth. When it comes to science, you will be told one thing by our enormously powerful and wealthy scientific and educational institutions, as well as by the mainstream news media that serve as their mouthpiece. But you may learn something else if you look at the actual evidence, that is, the objective truth. He does believe in objective truth. He just thinks science, at least in one definition of the word science, doesn't always tell us what it is. Skipping on a little bit, what is science? Science can mean different things. In one sense, science is the enterprise of seeking truth by formulating hypotheses and testing them against the evidence. We call this enterprise empirical science. In another sense, people think of science as the modern advances in medicine and technology that have enriched our lives. Let's call, let's call this technological science. In a third sense, science refers to the scientific establishment, which consists of people who are trained and employed to conduct research in various areas. Let's call this establishment science, or just science, the scientific consensus. Throughout history, the scientific consensus has often proved to be unreliable. In 1500, the scientific consensus held that the sun revolved around the, revolves around the earth, a view that was overturned by Nicolaus, uh, Nicholas Copernicus and Galileo Galilei. In 1750, the consensus held that some living things, such as maggots, originated by spontaneous generation, a view that was overturned by Francisco Ridi and Louis Pasteur. There are many such examples in the history of science. In a fourth sense, some people define science as the enterprise of providing natural explanations for everything. That is, accounting for all phenomena in terms of material objects and the physical forces among them. This is sometimes called methodological naturalism, the view that science is limited to materialistic explanations because repeatable experiments can be done only on material objects and physical forces, which of course should not be true if God is uh, consistent. In principle, methodological naturalism is not a claim about reality, but a limitation on method. It does not rule out the evidence of a non-material realm, but in practice many scientists assume that if they search long enough they will find a materialistic explanation for whatever they are investigating. This assumption that there are materialistic explanations for everything is not just a statement about method, it is equivalent to materialistic philosophy which regards material objects and physical forces as the only realities. Mind, free will, spirit, and God are considered illusions. Intelligent design, the view that some features of the world are due to an intelligent cause rather than to unguided natural processes is also regarded as an illusion. Not all scientists are materialists today. And indeed, modern science was launched primarily by European Christian theists. Nevertheless, science today is dominated by materialistic philosophy. Priority is given to proposing and defending materialistic explanations rather than to following the evidence wherever it leads. This is materialistic philosophy masquerading as empirical science, and I call it zombie science. I'm not calling scientists or any other real people zombies, but whenever people persist in defending a materialistic explanation after it has been shown to be inconsistent with the evidence, and thus is thus empirically dead, they are practicing zombie science. We find the most promise, prominent displays of zombie science in evolutionary biology. What is evolution? Evolution is another term that can mean different things. Simple change over time, the history of the cosmos, the progress of technology, the development of culture, or the fact that many plants and animals now now living, that's my mistake, are different from those that lived in the past. 
in these general senses, evolution is uncontroversial. Evolution can also mean minor changes within an existing species from generation to generation. Evolution in this sense is also uncontroversial. In 1859, Charles Darwin proposed that minor variations within existing species are preserved or eliminated by natural selection, survival of the fittest, and that given enough time, this process generates new species, organs, and body plants. Darwin argued that variations and selections are unguided, so the results of evolution are left to the working out of what he called chance. Evolution as materialistic science. Darwin described his most famous book, The Origin of Species, as one long argument. It was basically an argument against creation by design, and it took the following form. The facts of biology are inexplicable on the theory of creation, but makes sense on his theory of descent with modification. Starting with the fourth edition of his book, Darwin went further and argued that the idea that living things were created according to a plan is not a scientific explanation. Design was, as it were, ruled out of court by definition. And a neat trick if you can do it. It is often claimed that people in the 19th century were converted to Darwin's theory because he provided so much evidence for it. But this is not true. For one thing, Darwin could offer no evidence for natural selection, only one or two imaginary illustrations. And despite the title of his most famous book, he failed to explain the origin of species. People were converted to Darwin's theory mainly because it fit the increasingly materialistic tenor of the times. Skipping on, this explains why we hear little about the co-discoverer of natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace. Although the theories of both men were first publicly presented on the same day in 1858, Wallace was skeptical that unguided evolution and survival of the fittest could account for things such as the brain, the organs of speech, the hand, and the external form of man. He concluded instead that evolution must have been directed by an overruling intelligence. Darwin was horrified by this idea. As historian Michael Flannery has pointed out, Wallace's ID challenged Darwin's entire framework, a framework that served not only to bolster a materialistic metaphysic, but in effect proposed to become its operative manifesto. The inescapable conclusion, according to Flannery, is that Darwinian evolution, far from being a scientific, that is, empirical, theory, is one long argument in favor of an a priori metaphysic. I don't know who put the empirical in there. Um, be interesting to find out. So the Darwinian revolution was a triumph of materialistic philosophy. Microevolution and macroevolution. In the 1930s, neo-Darwinian biologist Theodosius Dobhansky used the word microevolution. Notice it is not a creationist who invented this idea to refer to minor changes within existing species and the word macroevolution to refer to the origin of new species, organs, and body plants. There is no way toward an understanding of the mechanisms of macroevolutionary changes, and I think I, that should be one word, uh, he wrote, which re require time on a geological scale other than through a full comprehension of the microevolutionary processes observable within the span of a human lifetime and often controlled by man's will. For this reason, we are compelled at the present level of knowledge reluctantly to put a sign of equality between the mechanisms of macro and microevolution and proceed on this assumption to push our investigations as far ahead as this working hypothesis will permit. That doesn't sound very <coughs> confident, does it? As we saw above, microevolution is not controversial, but Darwin did not write a book entitled How Existing Species Change Over Time. He wrote a book entitled on the origin of, natural, uh, origin of species by means of natural selection. And while he didn't use Dohansky's words, which came later, Darwin's theory was that microevolution, given enough time, produces macroevolution. Yet despite an enormous amount of biological research since the 1930s, the sign of equality between microevolution and macroevolution remains nothing more than what Dohansky called it, a hypothesis. And indeed, it remains a hypothesis starving for lack of evidence. 
People speaking for the current scientific consensus often lump microevolution and macroevolution together and refer to them simply as evolution, a verbal sleight of hand in place of evidence for Dopansky's hope for a sign of equality between the two. Such confusion is regrettable, but common. The scientific consensus also follows Darwin in insisting that evolution is unguided, though its adherents can be evasive about this point when it suits their rhetorical purposes. I want to dispel as much fog as possible in these pages, but I also want to avoid cumbersome language, so I will use evolution throughout the book to refer to unguided macroevolution, except where I specify otherwise. Nothing in biology. In 1973, Dobhansky wrote an article entitled Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. And by evolution, Dobhansky meant neo-Darwinian evolution. His statement has become a guiding principle in the lives of most mo modern biologists. It is now a fundamental assumption underlying most research and writing in the discipline. People who believe Dobhansky's statement insist that they do so because of the evidence. But what follows will show that this is not the case. Icons of evolution. According to the current scientific consensus, there is overwhelming evidence for evolution. The evidence is typically represented by images that have been used so often that they have achieved the status of icons. In 2000, I wrote a book analyzing 10 of them. The Miliari experiment. Uh, I'm going to just list them because most of these you know already most of what it has to do with. Darwin's Tree of Life, Homology, uh, homology in Vertebrate Limbs, Heckel's Embryos, Archaeopteryx, Peppered Moths, Darwin's Finches, Four Winged Fruit Flies, Fossil Horses, and the ultimate icon, which is ape like creatures gradually evolving into humans. I want you to notice that all of these are visual. All of these icons of evolution r misrepresent the evidence, and as we shall see, many biologists have known this for decades. So by the year 2000, the icons should have been removed from biology textbooks. Yet they were, and still are, used to convince students that evolution is a fact. Chapter 2 looks at the icon at the center of the evolutionary theory, Darwin's Tree of Life. The chapter also examines how evolution has corrupted the concept of homology. In chap let's see, chapter three summarizes why the other eight icons were dead in 2000 and documents how they are nevertheless still used today. Chapters four through eight introduce six additional icons of evolution that, like the 10 icons listed above, are used to mislead and indoctrinate people about evolution. Chapter 9 describes how zombie science has spread beyond science to religion and education and how it continues to corrupt science generally. Excuse me. Um, yet, I will, as I will also show, there are some rays of hope. The Tree of Life. Of all the misleading icons of evolution, none is more foundational than the Tree of Life. We know intuitively that a robin and a finch are more similar to each other than either is to a frog that these three uh, vertebrates are more similar to each other than they are to an oyster, and that these four animals are more similar to each other than they are to a daffodil, and that these five living things are more similar to each other than they are to a chunk of iron. And I might add, you could always put bacteria in the mix uh, with that. Uh, so far, so good. People have been classifying organisms like this for centuries, and the result is a nested hierarchy. Over the centuries, most people have believed that this nested hierarchy reflects a divine plan of creation. The similarities that we used to classify living things are called homologies. British biologist Richard Owen distinguished from homologies, the, uh, homologies from analogies, uh, features that use different structures to perform similar functions. And there's pretty classic illustration of a homology. Bat wing on the top, bird wing in the middle, and um, butterfly wing on the bottom. And you will notice that the bat and the bird both have one bone, then two bones, then a number of other bones. And in fact, the bat has five digits. 
you can count them. The bird has degenerate digits. The butterfly doesn't have that structure at all. It's veins which are not made out of anything close to bone. So bat and bird are homologous and the butterfly is analogous to the other two. Darwin argued that the best explanation for homology is descended from a con is descended. I, I think I put that wrong. Uh, from a common ancestor. In the Origin of Species, he wrote that genealogy is the only known cause of the similarity of organic beings. Thus, I view all beings not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of some few beings that lived in the distant past. Um, the Origin of Species talked about one or a few, with um, I think him being more in favor of one, but Darwin conceived of a great tree of life with a common ancestor as the trunk, intermediate forms as the branches, and modern species as green and budding twigs. And there is the only illustration in the origin of species. And you will notice that a piece of that is in the hand of the zombie. Darwin, in 1859, wrote to geologist Charles Lyell, I would give absolutely nothing for my theory of natural selection if it required miraculous additions at any one stage of descent. Notice that the job is to keep miracle out of it. That's important to know. Darwin spelled it out this way in The Origin of Species. By the theory of natural selection, all living species have been connected with the parent species of each genus by differences not greater than we see between the varieties of the same species at the present day. So that the number of intermediate and transitional links between all living and extinct species must have been inconceivably great. Very clear prediction of Darwinian evolution. There should be lots and lots of links. It's a magnificent image but it doesn't fit the facts. Fossils, the inconceivably great numbers of transitional links postulated by Darwin have never been found. Indeed, one of the most prominent features of the fossil record is the Cambrian explosion, in which the major groups of animals called phyla appeared around the same time in a geological period called the Cambrian, abruptly and without fossil evidence that they diverged from a common ancestor. Darwin knew about this in 1859 and he acknowledged it to be a serious problem that may be truly urged as a valid argument against his theory. He attributed the problem to the imperfection of the fossil record. But more than a century of additional fossil collecting has only made the problem worse. In 1991, a team of paleontologists concluded that the Cambrian explosion was even more abrupt and extensive than previously envisioned. Skipping on, he talks about ghost lineages that Erwin and Valentine refer to, and they even refer tongue and streak to their hypotheses as exercises in evolutionary seances. Um, the next paragraph talks about Darwin's Doubt by Stephen Meyer. Those of you who are long-term uh, Sabbath school people may remember we went over that book in some detail. So the evidence may say yes, but science says no. The abruptness seen in the Cambrian explosion can also be seen on smaller scales throughout the fossil record. The vast majority of species appear abruptly in the fossil record and then persist unchanged for some period of time, a phenomenon called stasis, before they disappear. In 1972, paleontologists uh, Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould called this uh, pattern punctuated equilibria. Interesting, he used the plural all the time. Uh, although to Gould, every paleontologist always knew, according to Gould, that it is the dominant pattern in the fossil record. The, uh, wh what do you say, call it, the trade secret of paleontologists in another part? Um, critics objected to 
punctuated equilibria that this is merely an attempt to explain away the absence of evidence for transitional forms. Indeed, some critics even pointed out that a pattern of punctuated equilibria is more consistent with creation than with evolution. But Darwin had declared this idea unscientific. Another criticism of punctuated equilibrium was that the evolution of new morphologic features by genetic mutation and natural selection would require large populations and large, long periods of time. Such features would not be expected to emerge in small populations in a short time as required by Eldridge and Gould's hypothesis. So punctuated equilibria is not an empirically supported explanation. It is really little more than a restatement of the observation that new species tend to appear abruptly in the fossil record and then remain unchanged until they disappear. Ancestors and tra transitional forms, remember expected by Darwinian evolution, are missing. From time to time, fossils are discovered that have features that seem to be intermediate between older and newer species, and some people claim that the, these confirm the truths of evolutionary theory. These transitional forms are missing links, often make headlines, but it turns out that none of them are actual ancestors. We'll see more about this in chapter three and five. Why fossils cannot establish ancestor-descendant relationships. According to British biologist Ronald Jenner, without a good fossil record, there is little choice but to resort to our more or less informed imagination to produce the historical narratives that are the ultimate goal of our studies of an animal evolution. Interesting what the ultimate goal is. Uh, indeed, our imagination is the only tool that can braid the fragmentary evidence into a seamless historical narrative that relates the what, how, and why of evolution shades of uh, the ultimate icon. The situation for evolutionists is actually worse than that. Even if we did have a good fossil record, we would still need to use our imaginations to provide narratives about an ancestor-descendant relationships. And that is, of course, because fossils don't come with labels on it, father, grandfather, etc. In 1999, Nature editor Henry G. wrote, to take a line of fossils and claim that they represent a lineage is not a scientific hypothesis that can be tested, but an assertion that carries the same validity as a bedtime story. Amazing, perhaps even instructive, but not scientific. Now note, Henry G. is an evolutionist. Uh, phylogenetic trees in 2013, I see I chopped off the end, a science education group reduced a lesson plan for teaching high school and college produced, that should be, a uh, dictation machine misinterpreted and I didn't catch it, um, how to construct a phylogenetic tree with differently shaped metal fasteners, pastas, or cookies. Even though the objects are artificial, the problems faced and the questions posed are similar to those addressed by paleontologists using specimens of fossils. Well, maybe the specimens of fossils are art also artificially produced, but um, anyway, uh, interesting. Cladistics, so shades of Bera, actually. Bera's blender. Um, uh, I won't go through the whole thing. It's, uh, if you're interested, uh, read the book. It has fair criticism. There is no element of time or ancestral relationship in a cladogram. Uh, skipping on molecular phylo phylogeny, similarity may be assumed to imply genealogy, but this is only an assumption. And he's right about that. Uh, the alignment problem. Computer programs are available to align sequences, but they depend on the parameters built into them by the programmers and sometimes the results are biologically implausible. In 2009, biologist David Morrison surveyed the scientific literature and found that more than one half of evolutionary biologists intervene manually in their sequence alignment, and more than three quarters of phylogeneticists do so. So much for uh, turning it over to the computer. In 2015, Morrison, this, uh, what, 10 years later, or, or six years later, uh, noted a proliferation of alignment methods, 
that produce There's something wrong with that quote. Um, that pr produce de uh, detectably different, uh, detectably different multiple sequence alignments in almost all realistic cases. Conflicting trees and orphan genes, which is in some ways the most interesting uh, part of the whole thing. Orphan genes, the author of a 2016 article about insect phylogeny decided to deal with uh, orphan genes by ignoring them completely. They explained that our approach eliminates any gene that is present in only a single taxon. So you're just gone. Because such genes are phylogenetically uninformative. Uninformative, that is, if taxa are assumed to have descended from a common ancestor, perhaps counterinformative would be a better word. So the authors cherry picked data from every insect they studied, discarding 40% of the sequences from the fruit fly. Talk about leaving uh, data on the cutting room floor. Um, and 80% of the sequences from the water flea in order to produce a phylogenetic tree to their liking. Yeah. The case of the missing trunk. If there were a single tree of life, its base would have been a single universal common ancestor, a single trunk. But discrepancies in molecular phylogenies have convinced some scientists that the history of life cannot be represented by a single tree. The evidence for a common ancestor, a common trunk in other words, is missing. And some evolutionists have decided that the evidence is missing because the trunk is a mirage. Skipping on, yet evolutionary biologists continue to defend the idea of universal common ancestry. For example, W. Ford Doolittle wrote in 2009 that he doubts there ever was a single universal common ancestor. But this does not mean that life lacks universal common ancestry because common ancestry does not entail a common ancestor. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me read that again. W. Ford Doolittle doubts there ever was a single universal common ancestor. But this does not mean that life lacks universal common ancestry because common ancestry does not entail a common ancestor. Why m such mental gymnastics? Doolittle freely admits that it is because much is at stake sociopolitically, ne mainly the need to defeat anti-evolutionists in the culture wars. Just let that one sink in. Homology. Homology is common ancestry. Uh, homology is tempting as an evidence for common ancestry. A recent attempt to resolve the confusion because if hom homology is defined as common ancestry, then, um, then technically it's not, uh, maybe the underlying facts could be evidence of common ancestry, but the homology itself, the fact that it's homologous that isn't. Um, because that's how you defined it. But what's worse is that you have convergence, which is, it looks like homology, but we know they're not common ancestors. And he gives animal convergence, and he gives plant convergence, and he asks what causes convergence, and then finally, we get to a concept masquerading as fact. As evolutionary biology has become more scientific in the empirical sense, the tree of life has become more illusory. Yet in mainstream biology textbooks and in popular television shows and science magazines, I'm sure that singular originally, the tree of life is presented as an unquestionable fact. Why? The reason science says that all species must have descended from common ancestors is that materialistic science abhors the idea that any of them are created. 
according to materialistic science, creation is ruled out from the start. If, as Darwin uh, misspelled, <laughs> thought, that's mine, by the way, the only alternative to the tree of life is separate acts of creation. And if creation is not allowed, then the tree of life wins by default, whatever the evidence. Ev evolutionists who insist there must have been a materialistic tree of life, regardless of the facts that fossils cannot provide evidence of ancestry and descent, regardless of the pers persistent inconsistencies in the molecular evidence, and regardless of the evidence against materialistic explanations for homology, are practicing not methodological naturalism, but philosophical naturalism. And worse, they are dressing it up as empirical science when it is really zombie science. And that's the end of chapter two. Now my take on all this, uh, as a member of one of the longest lived communities on earth, I disagree with Wells' take on eggs. But his point remains, take the pronouncement of the current scientific consensus with a grain of salt. In other words, Regardless of which side of that argument you come down on, it's still true that once upon a time scientists said that eggs weren't good for you, and now some scientists are saying they are, and the USDA is following uh, contradictory uh, positions. You can't just trust it. The book's main point, that the icons of evolution can survive empirical death, I think is accurate, and we'll see more of that as we get along further. The tree of life is problematic. Orphan genes, which have previously been largely ignored, are perhaps the worst problem for evolution. How do you get whole new s sequences of DNA that suddenly function? The argument from homology can be restated in a more persuasive way, I think, and that is, rather than using the term as an argument, use what it looks like as an argument, but I even if you restate that, it runs into trouble when we see remarkable convergence. And just to take one example, bat and whale sonar. Uh, you'll notice that the, uh, the, the homology, which would definitely be homology if it was bats and mice or something like that, uh, uh, actually gets all the way down to the molecular level to the sequence of the uh, protein in the hairs in the inner ear and to the sequence of the DNA that, that uh, prescribes that protein. Just amazing. And it's really hard to imagine horizontal transfer in that situation. Um, homology can only be a strong argument in the absence of convergence, but convergence turns homology into a w very weak to non-existent article, argument, pardon me. There are more sophisticated arguments regarding these two phenomena in icons of evolution, and if you want to study further, I would recommend that you go there. Um, the older book, I think, is still worth reading, and especially as background to zombie science. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. So that's so the problem. is not data. The problem is sociology of science. I think that's part of the point he's making. If you had better arguments, you would put them forth. The fact that these arguments keep showing up in textbooks, keep showing up, I mean, the tree of life, you've um, how many of you have heard people saying that the tree of life has huge problems and that there may not have been a tree of life to begin with, at least not an original trunk? 
this homology argument, it is used so often. Of course. And uh, uh, parallel transfer, of course, is not that easy. Uh, but it happens all the time. So, how do you deal with the sociology of science is a question I'd like to raise. Uh, because the problem isn't the data. The data doesn't work for science. Uh, how do you convert the scientific community that is highly successful in certain areas? How do you convert them to uh, uh, what the data says? Well, um, it doesn't. It doesn't matter what the data says. I'm talking about it. I want some sociological solutions here because facts don't work. I've said this before. If you read the defenders of evolution, particularly some of them. Um, when they're going on crusade, they sound paranoid. Um, there are two possible reasons for that. One of them is you get more money if you sound paranoid. And the other one is because you're afraid of real enemies. And while I think the former sometimes is true too, I mean, people have been known to fundraise off of all kinds of interesting political things. Um, I think that there is an underlying element where they really believe that they are threatened. And I think they are. Um, I don't know whether our job will be to convert these people. Um, but I think that what you do is the same thing you would do uh, in other areas where you think that uh, um, People are doing things that they uh, really shouldn't be doing, believing things they really shouldn't believe. Um, and that is you do your best to befriend them. If they're interested, you share with them. Occasionally, uh, even if they're not interested, you share with them, although I think it's probably a good idea not to do too much of that, as I think that that's largely counterproductive. Um, and then um, you remember that our job is not to convert. That's the job of the Spirit. And that our job is to simply be witnesses so that the Spirit can use us when it's time. And then move on from there. Uh, the thing to remember is though, I think that the pure atheist position is actually ripe for a fall. I think that they're paranoid for a reason. Um, but the uh, kind of theistic evolution position uh, is likely to be the next step beyond that. And I think that that one probably won't fall and that uh, the best we can do in that situation is offer people a choice. And perhaps it'd be a good idea to practice the same, uh, if you want to put it that way, the same techniques on atheistic evolution that we would use on theistic evolution later on. And by the way, the next book I have lined up is a large volume on theistic evolution which goes through it point by point, and I, I think it makes a very good case. Uh, yes, uh, we got a microphone here. Kind of what we've been talking about. I read something, maybe I heard it here. You can't win an argument on facts. They don't matter. What matters is how you feel, what your uh, religion, what your political persuasion, there's a number of different things that go into it. And facts don't matter. Y you get into discussions with people and all you do is go round and round. 
prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it. And so if facts don't work, uh, what does work for the Christian? Just acceptance and love and well, don't uh, argue. Okay, I think that probably the, the first thing we should uh, disabuse ourselves of is the idea that if we develop the exact right technique, that it will be unstoppable. Um, and the next thing I think we need to do is we need to realize that people are, lot, are all individuals. And if you have someone who is emotionally invested in some counterfactual, uh, or some stance that requires a counterfactual stance in some area, that uh, you're probably not gonna get too far. Because if they figure out what you're doing, uh, they will resist it with everything they've got because they're not letting go of that. Um, you know, Aldous Huxley commented that, um, that the reason that he wanted to believe in evolution is because it allowed him sexual freedom. Nothing you're going to do gets through to that. You just, you know, if that's the goal, then you will believe what you need to believe in order to allow yourself to do that, okay? Um, and in fact, you know, if you want to approach those people at all, you probably want to approach them at the underlying problem because until they let go of that, they're not gonna let go of evolution. It's too useful. Um, and they may never let go of it. I mean, the most intelligent creature in all of the universe is not letting go in spite of the fact that he believes and trembles. Okay. Uh, the, the next thing is that Saying that is not a uh, counsel of despair. That is, while there are some people that are unreachable, I think there are other people that are in fact reachable. And that what you need to do in that situation is to figure out exactly how they tick, exactly what they're looking at. There are some people for whom facts do matter. And there have been people who have started out as evolutionists and have become creationists. And one of the things that may be worthwhile if somebody is working in this field is to listen to some of those stories very carefully. Because you get at least how these people worked. Uh, and what influences they had. Uh, and for some of them, uh, uh, facts did matter. For others of them, they were fine until they hit a crisis and they realized that their worldview was not adequate for the crisis. And then they started looking for other ones. In the uh, former Soviet Union, there were a lot of people who bought the government line hook, line and sinker pretty much, started having questions about it, and then the government finally fell and they realized that this whole thing was a charade. And they went from that to saying, well, the government supported evolution, it's probably wrong too. What do you have to offer? And for those people, they are actually eager for it. And if you present the facts, it almost sells itself. You don't really, you know, it's like the difference between somebody who really has uh, all the cars he wants or the exact car he wants. Um, you can't sell him a car. On the other hand, if you have somebody who desperately needs transportation and realizes that what he, he's got is not adequate, you're going to sell that person a car uh, almost without trying. And about all you have to do at that point is to say, you know, this car does this and and uh, if you pay so much, you can have it, and here, sign on the dotted line, mm -hmm. and they're, they're gone. So it all depends on what you're looking at. 
And that's why I think you have to be really careful not to use a one-size-fits-all to figure this one out. You actually have to listen to them, you have to understand them. And in general, that's probably a good idea anyway. Yes? I'll, I'll bring in a comment that's politically oriented and quickly move off of it. <laughs> I don't want to see our conversation degenerate into a discussion of current politics. Uh, Jonathan Wells could have chosen the title of something like fake science mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. instead of zombie science. Now the reason I bring this up, my initial reaction was that zombie science is kind of a close cousin of fake science. It's a, a demeaning of science. And then I have to realize that he's using this term uh, polemically to, or maybe even using the term just to capture people's attention and to make a point. So it's, it's part of the debate whether science is fake or zombie, that's probably irrelevant for the ultimate goal of our discussions. So, so I'll move beyond that. At first it turned me off, I might have to confess zombie science, but I need to give him a chance and hear him out on this. Yeah, I, I think yeah, what he's saying is you destroy the basis for, let's say, the Miller-Urey experiment. Yeah. Oh, perhaps the worst one of all, Heckel's embryos. Right. Everybody knows they're fake. And as he points out, it's more than that even. It's that they start out very dissimilar, they get kind of similar. Uh, Heckel exaggerated the similarities. And then, and then they diverge again. And uh, Heckel's embryos basically concentrated on on the center and and then kept uh, uh, and then you know exaggerated it and then and then uh, made it made a point which sticks with kids which sticks with it does you know and and I mean you have tremendous resistance to getting those out of textbooks even though everybody who has studied the thing knows that they're frauds but there's a common appeal to human nature, and it's the idea that seeing is believing. And when you see, look at these drawings in a textbook, you know, you can use your imagination. Hey, that seems to work. I'd like to comment on a previous commenter about facts. Don't trouble me with facts. The thing about facts in science is that facts rarely come with a narrative. They come pretty much isolated. Here's a fact, here's a fact, and so on. And so the researcher has to draw dot, dotted lines between the facts, organize them. Taxonomy is a way of organizing facts of description of animals and plants. And you have to draw di dotted lines and you have to uh, put things together in groups, clump them in bigger and bigger groups, and so on. So facts, um, at least in my thinking, don't come with a meta-narrative. Meta-narrative being the overarching description of what we're seeing as an explanatory force. Now, I, I, I would disagree with that slightly. If, you're in, physics, if yeah. you're in physics and you shove a ball off a table, yeah. um, or you, you, you know, accelerate a ball to a certain speed, let it run, and then you let it drop, yeah. you can actually take a video of that thing. That's true. You can put grids behind it, and those facts basically speak for themselves. Yeah, yeah. There, there's, some, there's an implicit narrative that speaks loudly. So that's why I say facts would rarely uh, yeah. come with a meta-narrative. Uh, they don't shout the meta-narrative, but in case of physics, yes, there's something to it. Now, what I would like to point out is that creationism is also based on meta-narrative. 
the ultimate belief system of creationism is a meta narrative that can be traced back to scripture and rightly so. I'm not criticizing that at all. But what we all have to do as human beings, whether we're atheists or theistic evolutionists or creationists, young or old earth creationists, we all have to put a meta narrative upon an array of facts. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, there's nothing wrong with it unless it's being used to mislead mm -hmm. uh, a population of people and that uh, we want to have them go down a rosy primrose path and end up um, maybe even eating out of our hand and that exalts the power of science. I think that's, that's the real danger is to exalt the power of the meta narrative until it becomes the world view and that's what we see with our Darwinism today. Mm -hmm. And what's even worse is where we where we omit all of the problems, that we omit all of the difficulties because we know that if we do that people might not be eating out of our hand. They might actually be questioning us. Well said. Compli complicate the picture and extend uh, what Warren had to say there a little bit by uh, I like to make a difference between blind faith and faith based on evidence. Good. And uh, uh, so that, you know, this meta narrative, which is faith to a certain extent, uh, need not be uh, just totally subjective uh, if you've got facts to back it up uh, or to support it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can go down the route of uh, purely imaginary uh, suggestions uh, that are rather weak. There's probably no sharp line between these two ideas of a blind faith and uh, faith based on evidence, but uh, I'm much more comfortable with uh, faith based on evidence. Well, with that, I think we're actually uh, finishing close to on time. And uh, <laughs> so I'm going to um, uh, just comment that uh, next week we'll start with chapter three. We'll see how far we can go. Um, I do think that uh, what Wells has done is significant. Uh, again, we're, we're not mining all of the riches that are in the book, and I do recommend that you look at the book itself. And uh, you'll probably have more to say if you, if you do as well. Uh, so come on back next week and we'll uh, delve into chapters three and onward.